everyone and welcome. I'm James Milan. We are having a candidate profile in the form of a conversation uh, as part of the 4th Middlesex District State Senate race. And we are here at the moment with Cindy Friedman. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. So um, before we get into the substance of the conversation, I did want to give you an opportunity just to, to introduce yourself as opposed to me doing it. Why don't we have you do it? Um, and that way you can pick those parts of your background um, that make the most sense for you to share with voters in the context of this conversation. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so I am uh, a 37-year um, member of the Arlington community. We lived here for um, in, on Jason Street, raised our family. Our children went to the public schools. I've been in a community activist for those 37 years. I guess it's now 38 years, and uh, been very much connected to this community. And uh, I have been the chief of staff for Senator Donnelly, Ken Donnelly, for the last nine years since he came into the Senate. And um, before that, I was in high tech for 20 years. I managed hardware and software groups. And before that, I was a public school teacher. And uh, I bring all of those experiences to um, what I'm now doing, which is seeking the, the seat that has been left open by him. And um, I never thought I would be here. I never thought I'd run for anything, but I just feel uh, that this is, this is the right time, that because of my commitment to, to Ken and the work that we did together and the commitment to those issues that we have championed, um, that I, I wanna be in a position to continue that work. I also feel that given the state of the world um, and everybody coming up to me after November saying, what are we gonna do? Oh my God, the world's coming to an end. I'm not getting out of bed. Help me, help me. And my response being, uh, you know what? We all gotta get active. We gotta get involved. We have to get engaged. We have to get out of our comfort zones and we need to fight for those values that we believe in and that, that uh, that define our state. And um, as I'm saying this, I have a little voice in my head going, hello, Cindy, <laughs> that would be you. So life throws you funny things and <laughs> you gotta go along for the ride. So and here you here are, I am. here you are. Um, well, as you've already alluded to with good reason, you're, <clears throat> you've linked yourself um, you know, very closely with uh, Senator Donnelly's record and his values, et cetera. As, like to explore uh, your working relationship with him sure. a little bit more. Could you explain, uh, maybe give us a couple of concrete examples of, um, you know, the part that you played in developing policy that is identified with Senator Donnelly and his sure. record? Ken came to the Senate with a set of issues that were very important to him. And one of the really wonderful things about him was that he allowed me to partner so we had a partnership, so he had his issues, and then I brought my issues, the things that I cared about, which were very complementary to what he was doing. And um, I would say that my, those pieces that I brought were around homelessness, um, uh, housing, criminal justice, and the intersection of criminal justice and mental illness, um, transportation, and wage inequality. And um, so for example, I helped uh, his general counsel and I wrote the bail reform bill. Um, I wrote, we had a, a bill called the Middle Skills Solutions Act, which was to uh, align the state and community colleges and workforce training and industry um, so that we could produce middle skill jobs, those jobs needing more than a high school education, but less than a college degree. So we had a bill that we worked on, that I worked on with our general counsel and also with advocates. Um, I wrote a bill that um, was uh, to protect police who had been um, uh, hurt in the, in, during a violent act uh, as a policeman. That was a bill that I wrote. So, um, so I wrote numbers of bills and then I would advocate for those bills. I would get the advocates together um, the opposition together. Uh, Ken and I would talk about what needs to be done, his talking points, who to, t who to talk to, and we would do that together. Now, at the e at, you know, of course, at the end, he was the one on the floor. He was advocating, 
but that was all work that we that we did together. Is that uh, is that basically what a chief of staff often does um, with the person that they're they're working with, or is every, that unusual? Every situation is different. Um, the the chief of staff role with a senator is defined by the senator and the chief of staff. Okay. So in some cases, yes. In other cases, no. They have a very different role in the and uh, a very different relationship. So it, it really depends on the member and their uh, and their chief. I'm I'm curious. Is there something either that actually came uh, out on the floor in the form of a bill or proposed legislation or in any other way? Is there something that you disagreed? Uh, with Senator Donnelly about? So there's only one thing that Ken and I disagreed on, and that was the pay raises. I felt, while I thought that it pay was- Pay raises for, for the, the legislators? legislators, right, yeah. So while I thought that the legislators deserved a pay raise, because it really is true that it had been about 30 years, I didn't agree with the amount. And, um, I didn't agree with increasing chairmanships on, on both sides to those levels for a number of reasons. Um, so that's the one, one thing that we, that we disagreed on. But I honestly can't say other than that there was anything we disagreed on. I think I might, um, you know, we had this funny thing where if he were a little meaner, I could be a little nicer. You know, so it was more like, no, say this, say this, and he'd say, oh. <laughs> so. so my sense then is that you, do you see um, your own uh, your your own role and obligation um, should you uh, in, in fact uh, be elected to the seat as basically continuing the work the legacy the yeah the what his his record just continuing to build but, on that or do you see yourself moving in other directions as well. Um, no, I see continuing that because I feel ownership for that. I feel like those were my issues as well as his. And um, I got to pick so many of them. And he, um, we were just very compatible in that way. So it feels like my, I want that to be my legacy. So um, I'm just going to switch gears here. And there are a couple of things that are of, a couple of issues that are of particular importance to Arlington and Arlingtonians, and I just want to touch on those, sure. and then we'll spend the balance of the conversation talking about your own priorities uh, or returning to those. Um, so the first of these is uh, the issue of local aid. As you would be familiar with from your long residence here, Arlington is in an unusual situation at the moment, especially with school uh, enrollment uh, figures being as they are. Uh, lots of money is going to be required in order to deal with this expanding population. Local aid numbers um, for Arlington over the nine years that Ken um, and incidentally um, Sean Garbley have also been in office uh, have, if not flat, the, they have, the increase has not been great. It's been, I think, from our calculations, around 13%. That's different from neighboring communities. Um, Lexington, for instance, uh, has seen a, a much greater uh, increase. Um, wondering what your own comments are about that and what ideas you might have for ensuring that Arlington does not continue to lag behind uh, other, again, surrounding communities um, in, in, in the, you know, in this area. Arlington is in the unique position, as everybody knows, of having absolutely no commercial base. And I think that's where you're seeing the difference in that, in those, in those numbers. Um, and they are in a group of about, I think, 30 communities that, that suffer with the same issue, where they're, they're totally built out, they're small, they're dense, and, um, but they don't have a lot of room for growth. So it's, it's been an issue, and it, and it will continue to be an issue. I think that one of the things that we need to seriously look at is education funding, because um, Arlington pays a large portion of that funding. And... Um, to, in order to provide a 21st century education, we need a different funding formula. And I think that um, doing the foundation, you know, following the recommendations of the foundation budget, which determines how much money, what are the factors that go into providing aid for education, um, is, uh, is something that's really important for us to do. 
and, and something that I support. Um, I also think that um, we can really help Arlington if we, if we add money to transportation. So that's, that's not only Chapter 90 money, but helping build the MBTA up so that all the MBA towns aren't just responsible for the funding for the MBTA. Um, so I think, but it is an issue, and we're an incredibly well-run town. So it's not like we can sit there and say, well, you know, if you just clean up the mess, you'll have a lot more money. That's not true. And um, I think it's going to be a real challenge because gonna, we're going to have to weigh, you know, do we want to increase our density you know, versus what does that do with our quality of life? Mm -hmm. And those are, those are issues that Arlington is going to have to address. That's, that's up to the town and, and its residents. But what we need to do, I think, at the state level is ensure that there is money for those fundamental services that everybody depends on, education, public safety, libraries, that kind of thing. And we, so where would you, uh, again, you've identified the problem very well, and it, and it, and it is one. And I think uh, you're, of course, correct in saying it is not going away anytime soon. What sources of, of, of revenue or other ideas might you be able to bring um, to the floor of the Senate, for instance, to you know address that beyond acknowledging that that the problem exists and it's a it's a tough one. I think what we can do as a state as a state is make sure that our money is going into the right places and that we have enough revenue to cover those things that are that reflect our values and are our priorities. Um, so indirectly, that will put money, more money into cities and towns, I think. Um, there's a couple things that I think we can look at. Um, first of all, I think we can look at our tax expenditures, which is another fancy name for tax breaks. And we have hundreds of tax breaks that we give to different entities. Uh, we don't spend much time looking at them. Uh, we kind of give them to, to corporations, and then we walk away, or industries. And I think if we were able to actually become very transparent about those, that would change. So for instance, would we as a commonwealth think it's a good idea to um, give a tax break on uh, airplane fuel for personal jets? I would maintain many of us might have an issue with that. So those are one of our tax, uh, tax breaks, OK? So I think that's an area that we need to look at. And I think there's some money in there. The second thing I, I think we need to look at is how we spend our money. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. We spend $56,000 a year to incarcerate people. Con conservatively, 25% of the people in, in jails right now suffer from a se severe mental illness. For $56,000, you can give people a lot of service. And those people can live in the communities and be productive and live good lives. But instead, we criminalize them. So if you don't find that morally reprehensible, we ought to find it economically silly. Because if we took that money, or some of that money, and we put it into um, actual services for people, we would reduce incarceration. We would reduce our courts, what's, what's happening in our courts. And we would have money that we could then invest in other things. Because it doesn't take $56,000 a person to provide the right service. Another area I think we can look at is the fair share amendment, which says that um, we would tax income over a million dollars at a little, at a higher rate, at 4%. And that money would go into education and um, transportation. And I think it's fair to ask people who make more to pay a little more. We are, after all, a commonwealth. So, uh, and then finally, I think we can look at some areas around, um, uh, nonprofits and then property taxes. And, and I think specifically, um, and this is a bit controversial, but I think really worth looking at, our um, universities, private universities, uh, do not pay property tax. They're supposed to pay for a, what's called payment in lieu of taxes. They do or don't. Um, actually, they mostly don't. Um, but they get, but some of these universities, nine to be exact, have endowments of over a billion dollars. 
Um, now, they do wonderful things in our Commonwealth, okay? And I want them to be here, and I think, you know, Harvard, MIT, Williams, et cetera, are wonderful. But I think we're a little out of balance. When you have a $42 billion endowment, I think it's, it's okay to ask that you put some real money into the game. So uh, we filed a bill that would um, put a 2.5% tax on endowments over a billion dollars. And um, just to give you an idea, at 1%, tax if you asked one of those universities that will rename nameless to pay that 1%, you could pay for all the subsidies for low-income families and middle-class families in early education and higher education. So we could have that conversation. So I think there are ways to get money. And then finally, I think online sales tax is really important because that's where everybody's doing their, their, uh, their shopping. And we're not getting any taxes from that. So I said it's a real theme there that, that you know, looking at where deeper pocketed individuals and, and other entities, you know, are and asking more from them would be uh, a, a consistent theme of, uh, yeah, of I mean, what yeah, you propose yeah, to do. Yeah, I mean, deal. it's a fair share. I mean, and, and we know what's happening, right? The more money you make, the less you pay in taxes, and the less money you make, the more you pay. So I, I, there's a real imbalance there, and that, that's what we're seeing in everything, you know, in who has, uh, who's, you know, who pays taxes, who has influence, who gets to be at the table, and I think it's time for us to bring things back into balance. On that uh, issue of bringing things into balance and also to uh, get back to something that you anticipated in your comments just now, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, in fact, the MBTA. Uh, both its current situation and its uh, and and the future of the MBTA. Those two things are slightly different in that, as we know, in the current situation, um, there is, uh, by some estimates, including Mass D the Department of Transportation, um, 500 million um, needed in extra revenue every year uh, just to keep them afloat, and they have issues of debt and responsibility for pensions, etc. What do you think of this, and especially what ideas yeah. might you have for how to address the current situation uh, and, and put, put it on firmer footing, clearly? I have two things to say first. Uh, transportation is a public good and a public necessity, and it needs to stay public. Um, Second of all, I... So don't privatize it. So don't thing. privatize it. No, if we privatize it, it's a, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. And we have all sorts of evidence just in the past two years that that's a bad idea. Uh, and the second thing is, is the, the MBTA has been a real management problem. It's, it's really been mismanaged. It's not a worker issue. It's a management issue. Um, so having said that, I think that transportation is probably the key issue besides healthcare because it affects every single aspect of our lives, environment, education, housing, jobs, everything. And we need a robust, accessible, and affordable transportation system. So we have- I, I agree, excuse me for interjecting. Um, I agree, but I'm, I'm, I'd like to just pursue a little bit. You said it's a management problem more than a worker problem. So is the solution new management or is it new management plus m much other stuff? Well, I think it's definitely, I think, it, I think it definitely, there's definitely management to fix there, okay? And whether the um, fiscal control board is doing that or not, I'm not sure. What I hear a lot from the fiscal control board is how we're gonna privatize everything. And we're gonna actually privatize parts of the MBTA that are not a problem. I mean, yes, we pay the most, uh, highest cost in maintenance, maintenance for buses, but our buses are really old. Um, you know, so that would make sense. Mm -hmm. um, we have a terribly uh, uh, managed uh, pension system, but that's not the fault of the employees, that's a management problem. We have, um, th they will tell you that they have a problem with paid, uh, with a family leave act. Well, that's not a worker problem, that's a management problem. 
And we like to vilify the, the workers, and we like to talk about the incredible deals they get, et cetera, et cetera. But that's management. So, um, and I think we do it as a way to say, see, we should bring in private companies in order to fix this problem. Well, look at Keolis. It's a disaster. And not only that, but we've, what, we have, what, forgiven $62 million in penalties? Um, so we, have we just got the wrong people in charge? I think we have the, well, I think we have the wrong people in charge I, in the sense that I don't believe that, that, our, that our governor and maybe even the, um, the head of the Department of Tran Transportation has such a fundamental belief in, tr in public transportation. It is critical. Um, you can't get from Dorchester to Fenway Park without spending two, two hours on a train and a bus and a, I mean, that's outrageous. Um, but there's no, there's no vision. There's no, look, we want to be a 21st century transportation um, state where you can live in Lemonster and get to Boston, or live in Springfield and come to Boston or be, live in Boston and go to Springfield. I mean, we need transportation that's both radial and, there's a fancy word, circumferential, circumferential or something, or something <laughs> like that. And, and we're not talking about that. We're just talking about saying to the MBTA, you gotta, you gotta fix your own problems, you gotta get money. Well, this is a statewide problem and it affects everybody. People can't live in Boston anymore because they can't afford it. And, if, and yet if they move out, they can't get to their jobs. So. I think it's absolutely critical that we not only support the MBTA and, and fix it and maintain it, but that we expand public transportation. And I think the, one of the great things about the fair share amendment is that it goes to transportation. And I think we have to make a much better argument to get the stakeholders involved. Look at all the colleges that depend on the, on the T. Well, where's their investment in it? Look at all the companies out on 128 and, and, and 495 that are desperate for transport, transporting their um, employees back and forth. Where's their stake in the game? So I think we've got to get creative about that. We have to, we have to be committed to, to public transportation, and we have to get the stakeholders at the table to help us solve the problem, and I think we can do it. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, we have, we're running out of time. Surprise, surprise. So I wanted to ask you a couple of quick, quicker, quicker things, I hope. Um, one is, um, what would be one or two issues beyond what the ones we have already spoken about that you are committed to making priorities, uh, policy priorities as a state senator? Um, well, right now, I think it, it I would tell you healthcare because I think healthcare is under the greatest attack right now, and and, um, and I think people are very very worried about healthcare. So making healthcare, keeping what we have in place um, in terms of accessibility, in terms of what is covered, and and insurance for all, I would I would hold um, that as a very high priority. Um, getting costs, lowering costs, not bending the cost curve, but actually lowering costs for people, I think is really important and stopping this kind of constant cost shift, which goes from employers in the state onto employees and users. I think, I think we need to address those areas. So just a brief follow-up to that. You had mentioned uh, just, just a, a minute ago about the fair share amendment, which I know that you are uh, a, a big supporter of. That's going to education and transportation, as we know, not health care. Where is the money going to come from to be able to lower the costs that you're talking about? So, or does it come from so somewhere So since else? I don't have a lot of time, we have the most expensive health care of any state in the country, and we have the most expensive health care of any country in the world, and we do not have better outcomes. So as people like to say, reform before revenue, there is a lot of money to get out of that system. We allow our costs for health care to go above um, the cost of inflation. Why is that? So I maintain that there is an enormous amount of cost to get out of that system and still have better outcomes because other countries, every country around the world has proven that to be the case. 
We don't have the will to do that because we have so many special interests in that. We've got the insurance companies. We've got the pharmaceutical companies. Um, to and some you're extent, ready to take those guys on? It's, we have to. The, city, the, the whole system is exploding. Mm -hmm. people, can't, it's, people can't afford it anymore. I was talking to some firefighters. They make a decent living, but they're paying like 200 bucks a week for, uh, um, for insurance per family member before all of their out-of-pockets and co-pays and deductibles, which are just rising through the roof. So, yeah, we have to do something about it, and we better take it on. Tough, tough situation. Yeah. Um, super briefly, sorry. Uh, last couple of things. One is, what is one strength of yours that people may not know about that you think you would, you know, that you'd bring to your office, but that's about you? A strength that you have that you would carry forward in this work? And what's the biggest challenge that you foresee for yourself personally were you to go ahead and win this election and take that seat? a great question. Um, well, I think uh, I have, I bring an enormous amount of knowledge and passion and experience to the job. And I think that that's a real strength. I know the players. I know how the system works. I know the body of people. Um, they're, call, they're friends. Um, and, uh, and I believe very, very deeply in those issues that we've talked about and that I've been working on for the past nine years. And I know the district really well because I've worked in every city in town and with, you know, with people in those cities and towns. So I think that's a big strength that I, I bring to it. Um, I think the challenges, the challenges are getting the body to move, to actually have mm -hmm. the courage and the, um, the, the, the passion and the determination that we need to fix these problems. And I think that's the biggest challenge because it, it, it moves very slowly and people are afraid to and sometimes to make decisions. And I think as elected officials, that's what we're asked to do. So I think those are, that's a big challenge. That will be a big challenge for me because I'm not all that patient. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were patient enough to sit here and talk to us for this half an hour. We appreciate it very well, much. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. On behalf of Cindy Friedman, I'm James Milan. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.